Good afternoon. Welcome to Intelligent Talk with Ralph McElvenny. Join us every Thursday at 5 p.m. on the City World Radio Network as we discuss topics in politics, art, and current events. Okay, uh, welcome to the program, Intelligent Talk. The website is intelligenttalk.com. We're very pleased to have Mr. David Amram with us. His website is David Amram, A M R A M dot com. Is that right, David? Did I get your website correctly? Yeah, www.davidamram.com. Great. So let me just do a brief introduction. And uh, David is a jazz legend. He's a pioneer in the French horn. He's also a piano player, a flute player. He's done an uh, amazing uh, series of things, including the music for the Manchurian Candidate, Splendor as the Grass with Warren Beatty. Um, he was picked by um, Leonard Bernstein to be the first um, in-house. What were you picked for? The first composer in residence for the New York Philharmonica, right, David? Right. Yes. And uh, also, he's known just an amazing series of people. I mean, from Jackson Pollock to Franz Klein to Giacometti to Jack Kerouac, who he worked on his film, Pull My Daisy, a seminal film. Jack Kerouac, of course, wrote On the Road. And he's, um, he wrote a 1968 book called uh, Vibrations and a number of other books, including a book about collaborating with um, Jack Kerouac. So, David, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's my pleasure. I just, I just want to just briefly back up. You're from Pennsylvania. I, wrote, I remember reading in your book, um, how did you uh, get into music? How did you know you had a talent for, for music, David? How did that, what was that calling? How did that come to you? Well, I never thought much about having a talent, but I fell in love with it when I was six years old. My Uncle David took me to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra. And when I heard performance of Peter and the Wolf with Leopold Stokowski conducting it, I knew somehow that I wanted to be part of that in some way. And thought about that when I was just conducting my elegy for violin and orchestra at Carnegie Hall just two nights ago. And basically a classical composer who loves jazz and Latin music and world music. And continuing to write classical music was based on hearing that Philadelphia Orchestra concert as a little tiny boy when I was living on a farm in Feasterville, Pennsylvania. Okay. And hearing that music, I knew somehow that was something I hoped I could be part of in some way. You, you talked about it in your book, Vibrations, growing up in Pennsylvania. You encountered quite a bit of anti-Semitism. Um, you then find your way into music. You go into uh, Paris, the 1950s, arguably the highlight, perhaps, of the 20th century Paris in the 50s, or well, some people would say. You meet such interesting people as, as Giacometti. You met him in a, in a cafe, is that right? Yes, well, it turns out that Giacometti had played French horn, which I did, when he was in high school. And a lot of the artists and painters would come to hear me at little places that I played way back in 1955 with the Camillon and little places in saint de Pre. And a lot of the painters and artists and writers all hung out with one another. And because I was playing jazz, which they enjoyed, and playing jazz on the French horn, Jack Betty was particularly interested because he had been a French horn player and he was such a wonderful down-to-earth guy. And because I spoke a little Italian as well as French, I could communicate with him and he was just a wonderful, warm, brilliant person and very for real. All of those people that I met at that time and still meet, for the most part, are super for real. Did you did you have any idea he was going to be one of the most famous sculptors of the 20th century? Were you aware of his fame when you were discussing? No, I, I just I had no idea. Okay, anything about him except he was this very gracious, curly haired, deep, warm person, and I just liked him so much that I found out later on he never bragged or talked about his fame because he wasn't really interested in that as much as he was in what he was doing. 
he knew that his the old saying, by your works ye shall be known, was kind of the unspoken mantra of all of these people that I met. They were really working people that loved what they were doing and wanted to do a good job. Very inspiring to meet people like that and to try to be that kind of person myself as a result. Yes, I mean, you met... I'm just going to go through some of the highlights of people that you met, Dave, and let you comment. I mean, obviously, Jack Kerouac, um, who wrote the book On the Road, The Beat Generation. He did the film Pull My Daisy, which was a famous film. And I believe you worked on the music for, for Pull My Daisy, correct? Yes, I, Jack asked me to do that. And he also asked me to appear in it. I said, I'm not an actor. He said, no one else in the film is either, except for Delphine Siri. So I said, well, what am I supposed to do? And he said, just be you. That was my introduction to the Stanislavski method, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Except in the Stanislavski method, they would say, just be you, but the you that you are is also the person that you're portraying in the play or the, or the film. So therefore... You have to become that person, and that person has to become you. And that way, it's for real. It doesn't look like you're acting. You can, are you are becoming. Can you tell me, David, what, what Jack Kerouac, what do you think the Beat Generation, I mean, we spoke about this a little bit when I saw you do your wonderful New Year's performance, but basically, it was kind of rebellion against the conformist 50s. Is that correct? And a fear of communism is a way to sort of rebel through beat. No, that was, that was part of the whole era. And the, I never knew there was a beat generation, which I'm now supposed to have been part of, until I read about that way after On the Road had come out. Okay. This was something that was related for the last several hundred years of people who, from generation to generation, are the recipients of the gifts of those who came before them who take the time to see a gifted person and tell them, yes, you can do this too. You have to tell your story. You have to be yourself. The stars of Greenwich Village where I met Jack were the waiters, the bartenders, and the waitresses, and some of the painters and the musicians were people who were part of that whole picture of all kinds of people from every walk of life. And when On the Road came out and got a phenomenal review, they had to think of some way to justify a guy from old Massachusetts who looked like a French-Canadian woodcutter <laughs> being such a regular, warm, egalitarian person who was so brilliant and who was so loving and kind to others. They had to excuse the success of his book by giving it some kind of a brand name. Jack despised that. Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who's turning 100, refuses to be considered to be part of any beat generation. I certainly wasn't a part of a beat generation. I'm a classical composer that was blessed to meet Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and painters and poets and all these wonderful people. And we weren't particularly rebelling against anything or trying to be anything different. We were trying to bring compassion, excellence, and appreciation of the arts to all people we met, trying to be decent people ourselves in a society that often enhanced selfishness and greed. And we were the kids of another generation that came before us who had it much worse than we did who brought us up during the Depression with the idea that we all could help and inspire one another. There were ideals which are very old, which have nothing to do with beat. And Jack always said, the only beat thing about me are the Catholic Beatitudes, which I was born becoming part of as a churchgoer. So he was the least likely person to be considered to be a beat or a beatnik. So David, if I could just ask you, so, so he did, that's interesting, I didn't realize that he rejected that term uh, beat, and that he was all just about you saying excellence and his work, and being a, a very decent, sweet person, and he did not consider himself a beatnik, that's interesting. Who's sort of the leading 
light of that generation, arguably. Sure. Well, he, his book was something today, Ralph, all these years later, On the Road came out in 1957. Today it's a translated languages all over the world. And he wrote over 30 other books, some of which haven't been published. And one of his favorites, Visions of Cody, wasn't published until after he had passed away. That was just one of his many wonderful books. And that's the one that got a phenomenal review in the New York Times in 1957 that overnight made him an international literary star. I didn't, of course he, I didn't realize he had written those other books, David. Just from a personal nature, he was a very kind person, right? A very sweet person, kind of like Andy Kaufman from sort of what I've read. Well, I, I think I didn't know Andy Kaufman. I think he was much more grounded and also was not an exhibitionist and didn't show off. Andy Kaufman was brilliant, but Jack when you read his work, he was a, a writer. And Stravinsky said music expresses itself. And Jack felt his books would say it all. People say, what was it like with Jack? What was he like? I say, read his books. That's exactly what he was like. He believed, just as Lester Young told all his friends, the great saxophone player, Tell your story. Jack was all about telling his story. And he also loved America in a very special way and all of the people who lived in it, just like the composer George Gershwin, who celebrated the beauties of jazz and gospel and Afro-American music and traditional Jewish music and all the kinds of music that he grew up with in Brooklyn and New York and made it into something classical and lasting. Jack took all those experiences of everything from hobos to the heads of state and in his books made his life experiences real by telling his and their story to all of us to inspire us to also try to tell our story. Okay. Let me turn you, if I could, to some of the other people, because there's so many interesting people you interacted with. Arthur Miller, the famous playwright who wrote Death of a Salesman. You you work with him on, on the music on one of his plays, correct, uh, David? I, I worked on, actually on two of his plays on the premiere of After the Fall, which opened up the Lincoln Center Theater in 1964, and I was the music director for that for three years. And then he had a beautiful one called Incident at Vichy, and that had its New York premiere about two years later. And it was just so terrific being with him because he'd been a boy crooner when his family moved from Harlem to Brooklyn during the Great Depression, the beginning of it after the stock market collapsed and his family's business and everything collapsed. They had to move from a beautiful place in Harlem to in the to Brooklyn, New York, and he worked on the docks, and he sang and was a boy crooner. Just like the director, Ilya Kazan, he loved Chopin and Bach and Mozart and loved jazz and blues and traditional American musics. He saw the beauty of America, and Arthur Miller also had a great sense of the beauty of all the immigrant people who came here because he still had a sensibility of his forebearers who came to this country with the hope that maybe they could do something to make their life a little better and make their kids' life a little better. And Eli Kazan, of course, directed Marlon Brando and On the Waterfront, that very famous film, which really went on to make Marlon Brando, Mad and Streetcar Named Desire, so famous. But in, in, in your book, Vibrations, and talking about Arthur Miller, one of the passages that I found interesting, he says to you basically don't sell out, don't become like a Hollywood guy, don't trade for commercialism. And Arthur Miller had this great center, this root to himself of like talking about the common man and justice, and that's sort of what Death of a Salesman reflects. And did you, did you see that in just in speaking with Miller? Did he inspire you to basically not spend too much time in Hollywood and, be, and spend your time in New York? Was that something that was a guiding light for you, your time with him? No, he, he just said, keep it for real. Do what you felt you were put here to do. Okay. That's exactly what Dizzy Gillespie told me when I met him in 1951, when I had just turned 20. 
because I turned 20 in November 17th of 1950. I met Dizzy, I believe, in January or February of 1951. And there I was a kid, and Dizzy not only spent hours telling me about the diaspora of African-American people before they came to America, of the peoples from Africa and all the places they went and the music that they contributed and the music that they took with them in their journeys, but also that everyone had a heritage or heritages. They were all precious. And whatever you were born with, you should learn to learn about and love, share that with others, and in exchange, learn what other people had as a heritage and that they were all precious. And once you appreciated your own roots, you could appreciate everyone else's roots and you could be a citizen of the world in the highest sense of that word and be what they would say in Yiddish, a real mensch. Did you collaborate with, with Dizzy Gillespie uh, as well, David? Well, he certainly didn't need me. He was When I met him in 1951, he had made that extraordinary series of recordings uh, with Chano Pozo, one called Kubop, in 1947, I collaborated with him several <laughs> decades later. In 1977, we were the first Americans, along with Earl Heinstein, against to go to Havana, Cuba. But I had known him ever since he befriended me, as he did thousands, thousands of musicians and people. And he was, again, one of those people like Arthur Miller and Jackson Pollock and the other Kerouac, who had high standards, who was creative, who was innovative, who gave much more than he received and encouraged everyone to be creative and to do what they felt they were put here to do. So he was an all-around very decent person, David, right? Who, uh, another very decent guy. Oh, he was, Dizzy was extraordinary. And his humor and his kindness and his brilliance and his desire to make people feel welcome to what he was doing and what his people had given us as a gift. He said to me at his 70th birthday at Wolf Shop, he said, you know, David, he said, this music, they're celebrating before, he said, this music called jazz and all the arts of poetry and painting and acting and athletes and working people we've had in this culture, he said, are so beautiful. I don't know if America even deserves it, but I'm going to keep doing it anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Let me, if I could, David, turn to some of the other, because we have so many people to get to. Jackson Pollock, obviously the famous painter, the abstract expressionism, who died uh, in a car wreck, and I think in his 40s in the Hamptons. Um, He was a heavy drinker. In in the 50s, excuse me for interrupting. In the 50s, but I think he was in his 40s, wasn't he? And he, so in the 50s, he dies. He's in his 40s, and he dies in a car accident. Did you meet him at the Cedar Street Tavern? Is that where you interacted with him like you did with Franz Klein? Or where did you meet Pollock? I mean, such a fascinating... You know, well, I was told when I was in Paris, I knew Joan Mitchell, a great painter. Abstract expressionist was, painter, yes. Yeah, you know, She was four years older than me. I was just 24, but she was about 100 years older in terms of her sophistication. And just a wonderful, intelligent, brilliant person. And she kind of befriended me. And she said, look, when you go back to New York and you're going to go take the GI Bill and study composition and orchestration and try to play jazz in New York City, go to the Cedar Tavern and you'll see a lot of wonderful people like Larry Rivers, a saxophone player who paints. I had no idea, even knowing and playing with him but after I got there, that he was a, already a famous artist until I went to the uh, Museum of Modern Art and Sir George Washington courses to Delaware. And she also told me, of course, about Jackson Pollock, who I was familiar with from seeing some of those amazing paintings that he made. So I went to the Cedar Tavern and all of these people, it was like a working man's bar in 1955. And the painters all looked like they were mostly carpenters or plumbers or refrigerator repairmen. They were all dressed up that way because they worked in their studios and would wear, you know, jeans and a simple shirt. And instead of changing into something more elegant and fashionable, 
they that's the way they dressed when they went to the Cedar Tavern. So a lot of other people that either wanted to be painters or wanted to be artists or were fans that wanted to be part of that all kind of dressed that way. It was a, a dressed down place. And the people who were the kind of the heavyweights of that time, Franz Klein and de Kooning, and of course, Jackson Pollock, all you never would have thought were internationally renowned artists, because most of them had spent their lives really scuffling, having other jobs to support themselves. And when they became well-known, almost apologized for that and were very gracious and generous at Jackson, even though he drank too much, as many people did, was very shy, very warm, and brilliant. I knew a lot about American Indian sand painting, even as a prize student of Thomas Hart Benton, and loved all kinds of music. Where was this uh, Cedar Street Tavern, David? It was downtown, was it in the village? or? Yeah, well, it, it moved to University Place until it finally changed hands. And originally, it had a different location. And it, it was close to 9th and 10th Street and all the wonderful art, 10th Street art galleries are the places where Jack Kerouac and I did the first ever jazz poetry readings. All of those places were right around the corner from the Cedar Tavern. So that was one of the places that all the painters and people who like abstract art went. And then in the Venice Bayadal in 1956 would have became a prize winner. Suddenly, the international art world said, these guys and gals who are painting this way are now creating art of significant value. And suddenly, for the first time, Americans were considered to be the leaders in a new way of art. Right, the abstract expressionism, so, as you said, shifted the art world fairly from Paris to New York I, after World War II. Yeah, and so, so all, the, all the big collectors and very well-to-do people all suddenly started gravitating towards that and going to the Cedar Tavern so they could meet what they considered to be celebrities in a place where the idea of being a celebrity was totally shunned. The Lion's Head Bar, where you could go, where all the writers or journalists met. If you indicated to any of the patrons there, the bartenders, that you were a star or you thought you were a star or you were looking to meet a star, you were really given the heavy no from the bartenders and from the people who went there. And the same thing was true at the Cedar Tavern. If you were respectful and behaved yourself, you could be invited by any of these famous painters to sit down at a table and hear them arguing and shouting at one another about art and get a crash course in the arts. That's, that's amazing. Well, did this happen most nights, Dave, that you could go there and you could see de Kooning and you could see Pollock and you could see Klon? I mean, were they there half the week, four nights a week? Do you remember how... No, usually when they, they were all hard-working guys and gals, the women who were, were to Lee Krasner and all the other... De Kooning's wife, so Lee Krasner, yes. Came, there all these other amazing Grace Hardick and all these amazing women artists and sculptors and painters all worked hard and then they would go to the Cedar Tavern usually after supper time and then hang out all night long and then get up in the morning with a hangover very often but go to work they were very hard working disciplined people and the same was true with the writers and the same was true with the jazz musicians and the classical composers I met like Edgar Perez whom I met in Paris in the same circumstances, all of whom really wanted to do something better than expected, all of whom had a work ethic, and all of whom would always take the time to hang out with some young person and encourage them to pursue excellence. David, if, <laughs> if I had walked into the Cedar Street Tavern and I had seen these, these famous people, de Kooning and, and Jackson Pollock and Joe Mitchell and Klein, would one of them have stood out to me if I didn't know who they were, if I was just someone who walked in from you know, Russia and I spoke English? And I, what did, Was their greatness apparent to you, or was it just, or would it seem like regular people? Oh, no. They, they were all just, just people. And I think if they saw any person that looked eager and looked receptive, 
learning something, they would come up and talk to you. And everybody more or less spoke to everybody else. There was no status. There were no A tables. There was no full greed ahead. It's, and a, it's amazing. With, they, they, with, that couldn't exist today, really, it seems like, oh, right? Oh, it, it does exist today, and it's always existed. It's called, it's with James Galway, the great Irish flute player who I wrote a concerto for, when I said, Jimmy, you're an inspiration to all of us. I said, like Duke Ellington and Willie Nelson and Dizzy Gillespie and Leonard Bernstein, regardless of your international fame, you take the time to speak with respect to every person who crosses your path. Right. And he said, David, where I'm from in Northern Ireland, we don't endorse putting on airs. And that's the way all of these people were. Yeah. And they went to great pains to stay that way. And if they saw that you were snubbing somebody else and groveling in front of them because they had something that you didn't have that you wanted, some kind of recognition for their worth, they would call you out on that and, you know, say, you know, have some manners and go apologize to that person well, and don't act that way. You were told that. David, could, could I just take you in, because there's so much to get to the 1960s now, where you do the work with um, Splendor as the Grass, you work with Leonard Bernstein, who did, of course, the music for West Side Story. Could you just talk about Leonard Bernstein? What, what was he like as a person? I understand he, people say he was quite difficult. Did you find that? No, he was complicated. He was a, a true genius and a Renaissance man like Leonardo da Vinci, I guess, must have been. He was a brilliant speaker, a brilliant writer. His television educational programs for young people were phenomenal. He was a fantastically good conductor and a wonderful composer. And he said to me, what? when he chose me as composer and residence, the first one for the New York Philharmonic, and he said to me, what are you composing? I said, I'm finishing a string quartet. And he looked very sad. And he said, I never finished mine. <laughs> and yet, with all of his extraordinary world genius, he was probably one of the best known people, like Muhammad Ali, I guess, in the world. Sure. He managed to still compose music. And now, Leonard Bernstein the great personality, great multifaceted genius is is no longer here. But his compositions, what he put on paper, is beginning to be recognized and appreciated. I thought of that when I conducted the wonderful orchestra at Carnegie Hall two nights ago and did my elegy for violin and orchestra that I had written for ISTAC. No, I beg your pardon, for... for uh, great Israeli violinist in 1971 and that finally had it performed all these years later in such distinguished company. Elvira Darvarova played it. All of these musicians, including people who played with the Philharmonic and the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra and orchestras all over the world actually liked my music and I was able to conduct it okay and suddenly I said, boy, the thing I dreamed of when I was six years old of being part of that, here I was at 88, actually beginning to achieve what I hoped I could do and having it appreciated. And I realized that it just takes time and you have to just keep doing it. And sometimes it does take a long time. And Leonard Bernstein, I just wish we're here to see how much his compositions are now appreciated and he, when he wrote them during his time, people said, well, here's a famous multifaceted genius, but he's not really a composer. He's a jack of all trades. Right. Now people see he was a very gifted person with many ways of expressing those gifts. Let, let me just, he was sorry, let, let me just, if I, if I could just, just turn to the movies, David, like, uh, talk about, like, if you could talk about the Manchurian candidate, some people think Trump was, Trump is like a Manchurian candidate for Putin, but, I mean, you look at uh, Frank Sinatra as a starring role in that, I think John Frankenheimer directed that. D did you get to spend time with these people, with, with Sinatra, with Frankenheimer? How did your interaction with that go, please, David? No, I never met Frank Sinatra until about four years later when I was playing at the Village Gate for a George Clinton party. And the actor Martin Gables said in his big, beautiful baritone voice, David, Frank's in the basement and wants to meet you. 
I said, Frank who? And he said, Frank Sinatra. I said, oh, I went down. Because when I was there doing the score, even though Sinatra was one of the people who wanted me, and it shows my music because he felt I was someone who played jazz and was a stone classical composer who was not a Hollywood hack with 11 people writing the music for him or her and what is something that was original Pure. and I was lucky enough Pure. to be chosen. Right. But I never, I, I, when I met Frankenheimer, I was doing music for Shakespeare in the Park at the Phoenix Theater and play with my jazz group and his wife used to go to all the off-Broadway plays and he was doing Turn of the Screw Ingrid Bergman was in one an Emmy on television, and he wanted something that sounded sort of like 19th century neoclassical music. And she said, well, there's this young guy, and I've seen his music in all these different productions, and he can write that kind of music. So even though I was totally unknown, he hired me to do the music for the that Emmy award-winning television program. And then I did some more with him and then he had to do the music for the Young Savages in 1960. So when On the Waterfront had come out as a film and they had taken Leonard Bernstein and Kazan had done the same thing with me that he did for Bernstein and Happy Do Splendor in the Grass as a total unknown, in spite of the fact that Warner Brothers didn't want some unknown person. And it came off so well. When The Manchurian Candidate was made in 1962, they started working on it. I was chosen by a miracle to do that. And because Frank Sinatra and Frank and Harbour were so strong, even though the Hollywood studio said, we don't want that guy, he's, he's some kind of a weird freak that plays bebop and writes symphony music. They were more or less forced by them to use me anyway. And Frank and Harbour said, David, just remember two things. It's not a Chinese war movie and do what the film tells you to do. So I was given complete freedom to choose the best jazz players that I knew and the best classical players that I knew and create a score and an orchestra that would use them to conduct it myself, orchestrate it, write every note, and even play in it. David and Allen. to watch the film over and over. I, I loved working with Frank and Harvey and with Kazan and they were both brilliant at what they did. And they gave me a chance to do the best I could do. And they had the high ideals that I try to emulate today. And they didn't want a hack. They didn't want to use the Hollywood system where you have five other people doing everything and keep changing it around. And I was very fortunate to work with people like that. And that's why I'd never stayed in Hollywood because I realized I would be out there and either have to do some trash that they didn't want to do or have other people write it for me or worst case scenario become a ghost writer for the next day with Amram when they got sick of me so that's what I was going to ask you you don't regret then not being more commercial David and doing more films and sort of selling out if you will and no I've like... done some some uh, wonderful films I just did a film score for Barbara Koppel who won two Oscars wonderful documentary film about immigrant people but Barbara does her own films the way she wants to do them. She loves making films. She loves what she's doing. And in spite of the fact that she won two Oscars, she didn't do any kind of junk and trash because she felt she could move to a different level. She did what she felt and still does. I just saw her the other night. She still does what she loves and feels she was put here to do. Yeah. And she's so idealistic and so brilliant and so full of life and does such wonderful work. It's just a thrill to be with someone like that. Dave, and there are a lot of people like that who aren't even in the arts, who are plumbers and lawyers and doctors and airplane pilots and, and, and cooks and chefs and school teachers and bus drivers who go that extra mile to do what they love to do and try and do a good job. And that's what I'm trying to do, and that's the kind of people, for whatever I have to contribute, who inspired me to try to keep it for real and to try to do better than is expected. Uh, David, just um, going back to the, the 60s, if I could, because when you end your concerts, you always say uh, nice things about not valuing, because I've, I've been to several of your concerts, not valuing money and putting people first. And it's, it just is a very nice message of the 60s. And of course, you really had a, a part in the 60s and the music and the culture. What does the 60s mean to you? And what have we lost 
in today's well, generation. Say, I never said don't value money. Oh, sorry, whatever you said. I, I mean, I, I'm still working hard. <laughs> I get paid. Well, it's a thrill. I think you said value and the I, person, I, not the and money. I spend every cent trying to survive and give my hope that I can help out my grandson, who's now five. So when he goes to school, he won't have to have three day jobs, or at least he gets some help. And I also am a fanatic about paying everybody who ever plays with me, whether it's a chamber music concert or a recording for a, a film or a recording of my classical music or playing all the crazy gigs that I do at festivals all over the world when I bring some or some people with me to make sure that the band gets paid whatever I promised them they would get, regardless of whether I get paid or not. So I never take a job unless I have enough in my savings account to pay the people that night. And if you do that long enough, people know you're honest. So um, I just think that money is supposed to be something that you use to survive. And that if, in terms of owing other people money, you should always pay your bills on time and, and also always try to get what you're worth, but not be dictated by those who have an addiction like a drug addict or any other kind of person who's addicted to money where they think that the money is what determines anything. The money is what you get for the work that you have done. So the idea, I think, for any kind of person, not just an artist, is not to figure how you can get the most money by doing the least, rip people off, abuse them, and then go out of town. The idea that the sucker's born every minute is not a good mantra. Yes, well, I, I spent, in terms of the 1960s, uh, and what you felt that generation represented versus today? Well, I think the generation that I could see at that time of young people who were galvanized and felt that they, very often being the first people in their families to be able to go to college, were getting educated in a different way, and that they felt that even if they loved their country, perhaps this that particular war in Vietnam was unjust and crazy and really something that was a mistake. And they questioned what none of us ever questioned. You know, Franklin D. Roosevelt to all of us growing up during the Depression was like a god. We never we never realized he was just a human being that could make mistakes as well. And the, the first time a generation said, we don't want to go in the army and fight a war that we th think is we shouldn't be in anyway. And it turned out that that was the way. So a lot of the younger people were rebelling against that. And also many young people saw that kids who couldn't afford to go to college and kids who couldn't get into college were the ones who were being sent over there, just as the British Empire had sent people from Ireland to go over and fight their wars because they were half starving to death. They felt that this was not fair. So there was an increased sense of social justice. And because of the fact that there was been so much racism and discrimination against all people of color, they felt that this was part of it, that this was a way, just as the great progressive country of, of Cuba had sent African or based people to fight in Angola, that, that in a certain way, this war was a way to get rid of people that they felt were lesser and that they felt the whole thing was wrong. So all of us who were brought up in the John Wayne movies and when I was drafted during the Korean conflict, I went down to the draft board to make sure I could would be included. Suddenly, they felt differently. David, and, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm just running out of time, but I, I just... Okay. I just well, what, it, but, that's but an the interesting. main thing, if I may, yes. is that, that there was also some wonderful social activists and people who really cared. And then the music industry and the rock and roll industry took over everything. And with the explosion of the amount of dollars that were generated by a war economy, the whole 60s became branded and suddenly became a gigantic fashion statement. And a lot of the ideals and the beautiful music and the writers and the idealism all got corrupted into a pop schlock culture. And 
they're so irresponsible that the country was handed over to the right wing. And we're, what we're seeing today as a result of the corruption of what happened 50 years ago and what we're seeing as a result is a new generation of people in the year 2019 who are indie, independent, not in terms of politics only, but in terms of their own activities. Okay. And this is the beginning of a whole new era of people that can't be branded, who think for themselves, who have something to contribute. And I'm very excited to see, I've lived long enough to see what's happening today. All right, David, not just, thank yeah. you so much. I'm sorry, it's running out of time, but thank you so much for coming on. You were obviously a big part of the 50s and the 60s, and your music lives on, and um, you've done some amazing things and have these fantastic interactions, and thank you so much for sharing these very interesting stories with us and spending time with us today, and um, I wish you a very good afternoon, and I hope to see you um, soon again, and thank you, David. And thank you for what you're doing and for raising the IQ of people by using the Internet and using electronics as a means of helping people to develop and themselves and inspiring them to be creative, to be intelligent, and to be part of society. Thank you so much, Dave. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. We all want our kids to grow up safe and healthy, so we show them how, and we tell them with honest conversations that let them know what we expect. That's especially important when it comes to alcohol and other drugs. Kids need to know the dangers and how to avoid them. And when it comes to pain medications, opioids, they need to know that they should never be taken without a prescription and never shared with friends or family. It's dangerous and illegal. So talk with your kids, because when you talk, they hear you. Yo, what's going on? Y'all listening to Sky's Crescent Radio, and here's what's coming up. On the first Sunday of the month, we have the Poet Podcast with Dale Novella. On the second Sunday of the month, we have the Soul Tree Spotlight with Erlene Steven. And we also have Keeping It Funky with Troy Weeks. On the third Sunday of the month, we have Boozy News with Supreme Bars. And on the fourth Sunday of the month, we have What's Really Good with Jeanette Berry and Clout Dealers with The Label Noir. And every-